That's all right. All right. <clears throat> Ready? Okay. Come on. We're ready? Hello? Hello? We ready? Hello? Good morning, Otterbein. Morning. So I'm seeing things from a different angle today. All right. Give the kids a minute to, there we go, turn off the music. All right. So, good morning, good morning. It it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Okay, our announcements are in their usual places uh, on the back of your bulletin. I ask you to take a good look at that. Um, let me point out that poinsettia orders are due Wednesday. It's Georgia's. Right, Georgia? Wednesday? Yes, of course. Okay, um, so get down into Georgia or the office. Uh, a reminder about indoor volleyballs, Friday from 7 to 8. Um, we did our decoration. And, oh, next Sunday at 4 o'clock, we're going to have a special called uh, charge conference to talk about, well, actually to vote on the Boy Scouts of America bankruptcy. Uh, I've been sending out some information as it comes in, and I'm still trying to figure it all out myself, but... Hopefully this week we've been promised some more information from conference on understanding what it is and uh, which way they recommend us to vote. And I will get that information out. Uh, I sent an email out, but um, I guess I had some wrong email addresses about the instrumental ensemble. Uh, the music is just about done. It just needs to be copied out. And the email went out to ask people about good days of the week to call a, yes, Rebecca? Yes, actually, I see a lot of people here today. If we give you like five, ten minutes after the service, I can have music to you. Okay. Uh, so Rebecca's going to make copies of the music after church. So if you can stay five or ten minutes, she'll get your music. And then I'll start calling, uh, setting up some practice days. Uh, I think that's about it. Our runners are ready, so what, an <laughs> okay, now our runners are ready. <laughs> All right, so what, uh, what other announcements did I miss or should have brought more attention to? I like that.
can't see you from over there. Couldn't know if there was another cord. All right. Uh, I ask you to please stand as you're able. Let us begin our worship this morning with the greeting. The Lord be with you. Let us go to the dwelling place of God. For the Lord has chosen us. I ask you to please remain standing for our opening Advent hymn, Hail to the Lord's Anointed. be seated. We come to the time of our service to share in our prayer concerns, our joys, and I I thought since we just had Thanksgiving, maybe uh, with joys, things that you may be thankful for. And I welcome those of you watching from home, and if you have a YouTube account, you can type in the comments, say hi to CJ and Timothy back there. And if you have any prayer concerns or joys to share, type them in and they'll share them with us. In prayer requests, I received one this week. Uh, Jen Hafner would like prayers for a coworker who's dealing with health issues. So, are my runners ready? Yes, okay. So, what prayer, new prayer requests or any updates do you have? Okay, Judy has one. The coworker, Jenny Kovac, um, my coworker who I brought for your guys' prayer and support about two weeks ago, has had two weeks of in and out of the hospital, Um, lots of brain scans, lots of other things. They eventually found a stroke. Um, It was a mild one at that, but she's finally got to come home, and we have a lot of praise for that, but please continue prayer. She really believes in the power of prayer, and the more people who are on board with that, I know she finds incredibly comforting. Thank you. Oh, Kaylin has one. So um, thank you for prayers for DJ's grandmother, um, who was 102, passed away a couple weeks ago. Mm. And uh, while we were there and staying at DJ's aunt, aunt's house, her, his aunt actually ended up in the hospital. Um, she has, uh, has had multiple blood clots and long story short, ended up with an abdominal, abdominal bleed and um, is... Uh, home now, but still recovering, and there's some concern for other health issues. Okay. 
All right, other prayer requests or concerns, updates? Uh, Timothy, anything online? I think that's a yes. Yeah. It's on, okay. It's from Robin Berenberg, prayer concern. Erica Berenberg has myeloma brain tumor. Ooh, okay. By the way, I don't know if you do this, but with the prayer concerns printed in your bulletin, you can take this home, and then this can be something that you, that you pray with or over and to remember the names. Any other prayer requests? Okay. Then how about joys? Or did I miss a request? Did I see? No, okay. Then some joys. Becky has a joy. I have two. Um, it was a joy for Thanksgiving after not having Thanksgiving with the whole family for a year. It was just super sweet this year that we could all get together and, and um, give thanks to God for the last two years. And my second joy is for Mr. Bruner, um, who was available last, when was it, Monday morning, to help a neighbor start his truck. Something like that, yes. Uh, Becky was getting out to her car and somebody walked across the street and said, hey miss, can you help me? And it turned out to be a diesel truck, which I hadn't known at the time has two batteries. And so we, uh, we needed uh, extra help and Pat came right on out and got the, got the kid jumped and I've seen him drive his truck since, so I guess he's got it going. So um, I think we've all gone out to a car that won't start, right? And it is awesome when there's somebody who can help you with that. What other joys do we have? Are you all still full from Thanksgiving? Jamie's got a joy. Carl came in just before we were saying grace, and so he got to say grace with us, and we passed him around as we all stuffed our faces with turkey. He just got to watch that, but it was like perfect timing that we didn't plan, so he kind of got to spend Thanksgiving with us too. There are great uses of technology, right? So George was able to say grace with his family on Thanksgiving through FaceTime. That's cool, isn't it? All right, John. I'm um, just thankful and joyful for laughter because we had Playing last night at our game night, game night for the youth group, and even on Thanksgiving whenever we were playing games too. So, I mean, it was really it was a lot of fun. Just I just truly really enjoy laughter because laughter is infectious, and it helps the body out a lot. It helps your soul out a lot too. So, And there was some laughter on Friday as we were decorating. Looks beautiful, doesn't it? Uh, and thank you all who came out. It was a good time. Uh, the tree's still standing, Ross. No, 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 don't try to. It's straight. The tree is straight. Okay. Other joys. That's it. Oh, nope. Dina has a joy. So at Cornerstone, they do the Thanksgiving dinner for people, and I helped out with that, and it was very fun, and there were so many people who we helped, so that was very <coughs> okay. Other joys or other things you may be thankful for? Okay. Uh, Timothy, anything on the computer? Nope. Okay. Then let's take all of this to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, you lead us in your truth and you teach us your paths. You are the God of our salvation who promises that our deliverance will come at your hand. And so we come this morning to lift up our praise and thanksgivings to your glorious name. Now as you have created the season so that we might know that all time is in your hand, so guide us by the strength of your Holy Spirit so that the world may know of your love and your plan for salvation. Grant us the courage the opportunities, and the words to speak so that we can spread this gospel to all in the Duncanon area and to the entire world. Lord, make us into givers of your hope. And we ask that you grant your abiding peace to us gathered here and to those from whom we have lifted up. To those who are afflicted, grant them strength to bear their burdens. 
Bring healing to the broken and hurting, comfort to those who mourn, and the peace of your promise of eternal life to the dying. Bring them and all of us back into a whole and bright relationship with you. And Lord, we also want to lift up our great country to you, and we continue to pray for our leaders and ask for your guidance and blessing on them, as we also pray that your Holy Spirit will work on their hearts to transform them into your servants, so they will live and lead in your ways and in your will. And now we'll take a moment here to silently lift up to you the rest of our prayers that remain on our hearts. And we pray all of this in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who through the Lord's Prayer taught us when to pray, to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As John and the youth come up to light the first of the Advent candles, uh, a reminder that we will be singing one verse of It Came Upon a Midnight Clear, and it is the fourth verse. We sing it backwards in the verses in a, a way of trying to build anticipation. During Advent, we are invited to open ourselves to God's loving spirit. One of the best ways to do this is by being still. While our world maintains a hectic pace at this time of year, we have an opportunity to quiet our bodies, minds, and spirits, helping us to prepare for God's glorious gift of love on Christmas Day. Our scripture reading is from Mark chapter 4, verse 35 through 39. That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was near... Oh, Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. It is a challenge to be still today. We have many demands on our time. This is particularly true during Advent. We may feel distracted, depleted, and even disconnected from God. Yet, Advent is the perfect opportunity to be still and listen for God's still, small voice, calling us to prepare for the coming of our Savior. In this season of Advent, we will seek opportunities to be still and listen to God. Let us pray. Creator of God, in the midst of our noisy lives, help us to listen to your voice so that we may hear your words of love for us. Amen. Let us now sing the fourth verse of It Came Upon at Midnight Clear on page 218 in your hymnal.
Okay, as we get ready for, and thank you, John and youth, as we get ready to give our tithes and our offerings, um, and as the ushers gather, we're doing something a little different. Are we going to be doing this every Sunday or just today? Every Sunday. Uh, Because Rebecca says there cannot be too much music in a service. I kind of agree with her. Um, So instead of Rebecca playing during the offering, we're singing. You can stay seated. Um, and we'll be singing O Little Town of Bethlehem. And may the ushers come forward, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you so much for all that you've done for us and in us and with us. And we call upon your blessings on these gifts. We ask that you multiply them so that they may go out into the world to spread your love and your grace and your salvation. Amen. And now we have some special music by Miss Ashley. tuba.
Thank you, thank you, Ashley. That was great. All right. Um, now is the time for the children's message. So may the children and Miss Jamie come forward, please. You have to follow that, Jamie. So cool. Did you did you get to hear a practice a lot, Miss Haley? Yeah. She's like, yeah. So that is was really awesome. Thank you, Ashley. Okay, so we are decorated and getting ready for Christmas. Yes, into the Advent season where we wait and we get still and we think about the season and what we have behind us is this beautiful tree that we put up on Friday and you can see it's kind of sort of decorated we've got some gold and silver balls on there and we've got all of those gold and white decorations on there do you know what these are called we're going to help decorate the tree today and they are called you're right chrismons now I didn't know much about chrismons before I did just a wee bit of research and some things that I learned about chrismons. So they are Christmas decorations, yes, and they all have Chris Christian symbols on them. Now, just in case you were curious, a symbol is something that represents or stands for something, another thing. Like when we see an eagle, we might think about the United States. The eagle is a symbol of our country. We see the eagle, we think of the US, yes? So when we see the chrismon shapes, we think about Jesus because the chrismons are symbols of Jesus. They represent him in different ways. So they help us to remember that Christmas is about Jesus's birthday. And we see them on Christmas trees and we see them in homes. And something I didn't know about chrismons was they were first made in the far off land of Virginia which is pretty cool. I did not know that. I would have assumed they were from somewhere else, but they started in Virginia. And they're usually white and gold, and you can see that on our tree. White is a color for Christmas, and it means Jesus was pure and perfect. And gold symbolizes or stands for Jesus's majesty and his glory. So each of these little shapes, I'm gonna give you all a shape, is a symbol or represents, come on girl, you're younger than me. All right. Sorry, you're younger than I am. Let's throw the pronoun usage is not good. Okay, we got a couple of them here. Got two each. Here you go, grab another one. Okay, grab that one. We. Thank you. And Gabe, here you go. Take a second one. All right, and I've got two. Okay, so when we go over the, I, what I want you to do, I know the fish has a fish hook, imagine that. Um, I'm going to have you, do you have two? No. Well, okay, have a second one. Take a second one. When, okay, so Gabe, I'm gonna have you stand up. Do you think you, you, you're bold enough to stand up? Sure you are. All right, let's see what you got. I want you to hold up your Chris, one, pick one, and you hold it up, hold it up for everybody to see. You might need to walk around a little bit. Okay, this one is um, a symbol that represents or stands for the Christian Trinity of God, and Trinity is three. It's a, and I'm not sure if I'm saying a triquerta, and it's made of three loops. Can you kind of hold it super high? You're a tall guy, hold it up high. It's three loops that make a triangle and it represents the three parts of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Would well, you want to go up and put it on the tree so we can see that? So Gabe's going to put that on the tree. That represents the Trinity. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Dirk, do you want to stand up and hold up one of yours while Gabe is... You don't want to? What if I stand up with you? Come on. How about I hold it for it? You want it? Well, you're gonna have. You have two, so we're just gonna pick one, and then you can do the last one. And I'll stand up for you, Derek. What would you like? Which one? Pick one. The fish. There we go. That's a cool one. Fish. Okay, this is the fish. It's one of the oldest Christian symbols, and it's the word for fish in Greek. There's the J. Ichthys, and here we go. Well, anyway, it stands for Jesus Christ, Savior. And did you know some of his disciples were fishermen? So that fish is one of the oldest symbols. When we see that, we think of Jesus. So are you going to put that on the tree? Yep. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Pastor Chris. 
All right, Haley, pick one. Come on, stand up. Stand up. I feel like when I'm at Scouts, hold it up so we can see it. That is the anchor, and the it's an anchor cross. Actually, you can see the cross at the top and then the little anchor part at the bottom. And that um, reminds Christians that Jesus is the anchor of our faith. So you want to put that on the tree, please? Thank you much. You're next, Miss Maggie. Up you go. Pick one. Hold it up. You're Vanna White, if we all know who Vanna White is. Okay, hold it up super high. Okay, that is a harp. And that is a stringed instrument, the harp, and it represents or is symbolic of music that praises God. So go ahead and do you want to put that on the tree, please? Thank you. I like your bear. You are next, Miss Lee. Up you go. Stand up. Come on. You're a cheerleader. You're used to this. Up you go. All right. That one is the Cairo cross. It looks like a P, and then it looks like it has an X in it. Do you guys see that? All right, that, uh, the first two letters of the Greek word for Christos, which means Christ. So we put that on the tree. So when we see these, we know so far that we're seeing the, the Trinity of God, and we see the words, the letters that, that are for Christ and the music that we play. All right, one more round. Oh, this one. I know, I couldn't find one for that, so we're just going to be very quiet about that one for right now. All right, Gabe, how about your last one? Okay, stand up. This is the butterfly, and the butterfly uh, stands for a transformation or a changing, and the immortal soul that we have that will live with Jesus. So you can go ahead and put that on there anywhere you want. Doesn't matter. Awesome. Okay, Dirk, here we go again. No, you're going to be, you said you'd be last, right? You're going to offer to be last? If you're going to be last, you get to stand up. Yes? Deal? Okay. All right, Miss Haley, there we go. That is a symbol or it represents uh, Jesus, who is sometimes called the Lamb of God. All right, on it goes. You do or don't? You do? All right, up you go. That's the fleur de lis, and that is a flower like symbol and represents the Virgin Mary. From my research, I'm hoping I'm right. Okay. Or the New Orleans Saints, but yeah, no. All right, cool. All right, one more. Wait, no, you said. Well, before you. One more before you. All right, Miss Maggie, that's the five pointed star. Represents um, the five wounds on Jesus on the cross. So you can put that on there. Two in the hands, two in the feet, one on the side, making sure I'm getting that right. And the Christmas star. And the Christmas star, which we see up top. Thank you. Keep me straight. All right, last one. Up you go, Mr. Dirk. Stand up, because you're going to put it on the tree. You might as well stand up. There we go. That is, what is that? Do you know? It's a dove, and that's a symbol of peace and the Holy Spirit. And it's shown when we hang it up, it's going to be pointing downward. Can you do it so it's holding it downward? Pointing down to show that the Holy Spirit appeared as a dove when Jesus was baptized. So go ahead and put that on. It the first one. It, well, randomly put them on the paper. So why don't you put that on the tree? All right, so those are just a few. There are a bunch of different shapes up there, and we didn't have all of them up there, but we do have a few. And so I want you to think about when you're looking at that tree every week um, as we wait for Christmas and we wait for Jesus to be born, to think about what all of those different um, shapes stand for, from um, the dove of peace and Jesus' baptism all the way to him being the anchor of our faith, okay? So let's say a prayer here as we get ready to move on with the service. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for your love and thank you, Lord, for sharing um, with us your life and for bringing these beacons of, of light up here to the front to share all of the things that represent you. Watch over us this week as we go back to school and help us all to be beacons of your love and joy and light so that we can share you with others. Um. Thank you, Jamie. <clears throat> so now we come time to our scripture readings, but just a little uh, note that when I get to the message, I have something for those of you who liked doing the a little bit of research on your tablets or 
phones, get them out and get them ready, because I'll have a question for you to look up. But let us, uh, let us start here in our readings from the book of the prophet Jeremiah, and in Advent it's always good to talk about the prophecies of God, and that will tie in a bit in our message too. So this is a particular prophecy from the book of Jeremiah. We're in the 33rd chapter in verses 14 through 16. Now the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judah. In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line, and he will do what is just and right in the land. And in those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called, the Lord, our righteous Savior. Now, our epistle reading, and remember, remember epistles, just an old-fashioned way of saying mail. Uh, reading is from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, and we are in the third chapter, verses 9 through 13. And you can tell Paul really liked the church in Thessalonica. And Paul writes, How we thank God for you. Because of you, we have great joy as we enter God's presence. Night and day we pray earnestly for you, asking God to let us see you again, to fill the gaps in your faith. Now may God, our Father and our Lord Jesus, bring us to you very soon. And may the Lord make your love for one another and for all people grow and overflow just as our love for you overflows. May he, as a result, make your heart strong, blameless, and holy as you stand before God our Father when our Lord Jesus comes again with all his holy people. Amen. That's a great prayer, isn't it? So I ask you to please stand as you're able to sing the Gloria Patri. Please remain standing for our gospel reading, which comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, verses 25 through 36. And Jesus is going to talk about his next coming. He said, There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. And at that time they will see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Now he told them this parable. Now look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Now be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life, and that day will close on you suddenly like a trap. For it will come on all those who live on the face of the whole earth. So be always on the watch. And pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. And this is the word of God for the people of God. I ask you to remain standing for our praise hymn and Rebecca once or twice. Once.
Please be seated. And by the way, you at home, you can also uh, look up my question and I'll tell it to you right now. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit and come back to you with your answer. So if you're willing and wanting to look something up, this is what I'd like you to look up. How many Old Testament prophecies did Jesus fulfill? I'll say that again. How many Old Testament prophecies did Jesus fulfill? Okay, and again, you at home can do that and type in the answer and uh, Timothy will let me know. So, while everyone is looking that up, let's talk a little bit about Advent. It is a wonderful season, four Sundays, as we prepare for Christmas, the birth of Jesus. Uh, like Lent, a season of preparation before Easter, it is time to get ready, get our hearts, our minds, our souls ready. Um, all right. Uh, now, one of the things, okay, trying to figure out how to put this together in my head. So, one of the things that we need to understand about the birth of Jesus is that he does fulfill prophecies. I'll get to your answers in just a moment. And let's be honest, a prophecy from God is a promise from God. Amen? God says this will happen, and when God says something will happen, guess what? It happens. Now, let's be honest, it happens on his time, right? <laughs> It doesn't always happen on our time, but it happens on his time. And one of the most important things to remember as we go through all of this and every day is God keeps his promises. Okay, um, let me see online. Do we have an answer online? Not yet, okay. All right, so uh, raise your hand. Who has an answer? T Tim, now you have an answer? Or you looked it up? Uh, okay, hold on. I'll, I'll get, because guess what? You're going to learn something really quickly. Timothy, what's the number you have? Uh, I have three John, what do you have? Uh, Who did I see over here? Ashley, what do you have? Okay, Galen. All right, uh, Debbie. Dina. 300. Brady. 65. I don't know. Google Google's a heathen thing. No. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Uh, who else? Did I see something over here? <laughs> Smart Alec. Okay, any other numbers? Okay, Timothy, last call for anyone online giving a number? Okay, so part of the problem is deciding what's a prophecy and what's not. Uh, so there, you can see some disagreement, but do you see the range? What was the lowest number, 300? 55, okay, well. <laughs> okay, let's say just for the matter of point that it is 55. 55 prophecies, and the typical number is around 200, by the way. Um, although I, 300 seemed to be a pretty constant number here. But let's just say 55. 55 specific prophecies made anywhere between 500 to 2,000 years before his birth. How's that for impressive? And like I said, it's probably closer to the, the, the 300 number. Becky? Okay, so uh, the probability of somebody predicting 40, how many? 48, 48 prophecies correctly is 1, 10 to the 158th power. I don't even know what that number is. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. Um, in other words, we are straining credulity, right? It is an impossibility, right? Now we up it to 300 and who knows how large that number is. So, when God makes a promise, he keeps the promise, amen? Now, all of that is important. Um, 
I think I mentioned there's a uh, contemporary Christian song, and I keep forgetting to look up the name of it, but there's a lyric that says, because he has, you know he can. I think I messed it up a little bit, but that is why we remember the past, and we remember all that God did. This is why in the Old Testament, even in the New Testament, God is referred to as the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. It's not that he's, those are the only three people who have God as a God. It's first to remember, oh yeah, I remember the Abraham stories. Oh, I remember these stories. You know, so often also, God in the Psalms is mentioned as the God of who delivered them out of Egypt. It is to cause us to remember what God has done. And when we remember and understand and believe that God has done what he's done, then we know that God is still with us and God can continue to do great works. And as we have Advent, and we head toward the manger, we also remember that there is a promise yet to be fulfilled. And we hear that a little bit in the epistle reading, and we heard it very much in Jesus saying, and that is Jesus will come again. And so for a Christian, the reality is that Advent and Christmas is kind of this dual thing. Yes, we're getting ready, but we also need to get ready for the coming of Christ again. All right, so let me ask you a question. Let's, uh, let's get a little fun here again. Um, Christmas, we need to prepare for Christmas. Some of you are already prepared, but what are some of the ty- types and kinds of things you guys do to prepare for Christmas? Now, I know for my family, um, I'm hoping this afternoon that we'll rearrange the living room to make uh, the tree fit. Um, we're not going to decorate the tree because Dan and Amy brought their wonderful dog, Suki. So we have two 50 plus pound dogs that are both puppies. So we're not putting decorations <laughs> up quite yet, but we have to get a, um, a platform ready because we have this Christmas village that we put together. So what do you guys do to prepare for Christmas? <sighs> Kathy, what do you really do? You get a tree, right? (laughs) Interact with the people, they said. (laughs) Yeah, be fun, they said. Okay. Um, Is your tree up yet? No. This afternoon. Okay. So you have to go get the boxes and stuff. Yes. Okay. Sure, Becky. Oh, write out Christmas cards. What else do we do to prepare? I see uh, Dina and Michaela. So Dina first. No, you're not. (laughs) Dina and Morgan. Okay, now Morgan doesn't want to do it, so. How about Dina? Um, Ah, yes, get presents and wrap. Well, now, to wrap, what do we need to get? Wrapping paper and? Tape, scissors. We're always forgetting our tape and we start, oh shoot, we forgot to get tape. Morgan, are you gonna forgive me and? Ah, outside decorating, that's good. What else do we do? Baking, Baking. yes. Both fun and a curse, right? Uh, Who's, yes, Dirk? Uh, Mom, do you wanna check that first? Timothy, you can, uh, CJ, you can go to the next slide anyway as we do this. All right, should I stop now or? All right. Over here, nobody said anything over here. What do you guys do to prepare for Christmas? All right, Jane? Scheduling visits with family. Oh, yes. Yes. Yes, because if we miss our family obligations, we get in trouble, right? <laughs> it's like, mm hmm. Okay, anyone else want to share the things that we do to prepare? Anyone have like a, a, an interesting family tradition? John almost fell off his chair. Yes, John. Praying, Praying. that's always, yes. Yes, Kaylee? Christmas, Christmas. Christmas. yes. And, and if you're the church secretary, you play it all year long. 
Okay, Becky? Burn a bay berry candle on Christmas Eve. You and I have never done that, have we? I don't remember, right? Is that something growing up that you did? What was the symbolism of the bay berry? Does anyone know? Just good luck? Like eating sauerkraut on New Year's Day? I never figured that one out. If you eat rotten cabbage on the first day of the year, you'll have a good year. All right, I'm sorry. What, one more, Bra- Mary or Brady? Mary. Oh, Advent calendars, yes. And they, they've gotten really uh, popular with things. You can even buy like Lego Advent candles and all that. All right, so the point is, we do a lot of preparing for Christmas, don't we? You know, the, the, the decorating, and, and for some people, the decorating takes planning on in the outside lighting, especially if you're one of those people who do the coordinate it with music and all that. Um, getting the tree up, decorating the tree. Uh, we have yearly ornaments is our family tradition. We buy one specific ornament a year, sometimes two, that remind us of some big event that occurred that year. Um, and I, and I bet you each and every one of us has something kind of like that, right? A, a family tradition that we do and has to be done. There's a lot of work, a lot of preparation for that joyous day. All right, so now let me take all that and ask you this. How are you preparing for Christ's return? Yeah. We don't think about that a lot, do we? But you know, Christ preaches about that a lot. You know, he tells parables about it. You know, if the master knew when the thief would come, that was about Jesus coming again. And so, let me put to you that, well, any time of the year is a great year to start this, but what a great time in Advent to take a look at ourselves and to prepare ourselves. Are we ready? If Christ were to come back today, are you ready? What do you still need to do? So if you haven't already made it a daily habit to read scripture, to have a prayer, you know, morning or evening, however you want to do that, uh, I would encourage you to start. And to, to take and examine yourself, and what are those things that I know I need to change, but I, I, I'm struggling with? And the most typical response I've heard to that is, For many people, there's the weight of unforgiving, of not being able to forgive somebody. It's a very common thing. We've all, can I say that? We've all been hurt by someone in our life, badly, deeply, betrayed. And so, as we come to the birth of the Christ child who will die on the cross for our sins to forgive us, let us remember the importance of us forgiving others. And, and in case you've never heard this before, I want to let you know that forgiveness can be like a switch. It can be like one day I forgive and that's it. But for the deeper hurts, it tends to be a process. Something that you work on. And you continue. And if you have somebody in your life that you're having problems forgiving, what I would suggest to you is two things. First of all, pray for them. Pray that God blesses them. And just leave it right there. <laughs> you know? Don't ask them how, don't say how God should bless them because then that usually brings in our own anger. But pray that God blesses them. I guarantee you that over time, maybe not a day, not a week, it may even take more than a month, but your heart will soften. And the other thing is make it a habit of every day, whether in your prayers or a quiet time, to say, I forgive that person even if you don't mean it at first. Because if you say it every day and you combine that with praying for that person every day, you know what happens is that gives the Holy Spirit an in on you. And the Holy Spirit will start to work and you will find your heart softened toward that person. And one day you will say, I forgive that person. And you're going to realize you mean it. And, and, And by the way, have you noticed that not forgiving someone hurts us more than the other person. It's a weight on our shoulders, not their shoulders. That person's out there doing something. They have no idea that you can't forgive them and not a care in the world about it. 
And yet here we are, right? With this huge weight on our shoulders. Work on forgiveness, on loving the difficult people in our lives. Because we know Jesus loves some very difficult people, amen? Those disciples were not the easiest people to get along with, and Jesus loved all of them. So as we do our joyous preparations for Christmas, I ask and remind you to work on yourself. Allow the Holy Spirit to work to change you into the person that God wants you to be, the person you know you can be. So that on that day, you can stand in the love and grace of Christ and with the power of the Holy Spirit and stand right in front of Jesus when he comes again. Amen. And so we come to our last hymn and it is both a hymn about the birth and also a hymn about Jesus coming again. So I ask you to please stand as you're able to sing our last hymn, number 196, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. receive this morning's commission and blessing. Grant, O oh Lord, that what has been said here with our lips, we will believe in our hearts. And what we believe in our hearts, we will go out and live out each and every day of our lives. And we pray all this through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and all of God's children say, Amen. Amen.